It seems nearly axiomatic that the people who say they despise political parties and the rancor of partisan politics don't really despise political parties so much as they despise that there are people who have ideas that are different from their own. Nearly all people who have seemingly indifferent, underdeveloped thoughts on important issues find themselves repulsed by people who have very strong convictions, no matter what those convictions are. But how many of these people are there really? Well, if you listen to many party officials and the media pundits, they'll claim that this moderate middle is large and decides elections, so naturally they must be catered to. I say that is all bunk, and I'll explain why I feel that way, and what we may be able to do to counter it as we have another hazardous conversation. Trigger warning disclaimer. Hazardous conversations pushes rhetorical boundaries for acceptable political discourse. Listening to this program could have the uncomfortable side effect of provoking deep intellectual inquiry into foundational principles of liberty. Listener discretion is advised. Every single election cycle, which with the news cycle these days has become nearly constant, it seems we are inundated with the repetitive, how do we attract the moderates, or we have to appeal to independent nonsense. Whether it comes from the media, the politicians, or the party insiders, it's the same old drumbeat. We have to compete for the middle. Folks, I hate to break it to you, but there is no middle. It's a myth. There may, at one time, long ago in a republic far, far away, been something akin to what people today think the political middle is. But it is nothing more than a facade. That doesn't mean that there isn't a huge swath of people out there that think they're in the political, quote, mainstream, as if there really is such a thing, and or independent. Oh no, they certainly do exist, but they are not what either they or anyone else thinks they are. I have found that most people that place themselves in the independent category are anything but. They dislike the party, both the Republican and Democrat wings, that's true enough. And they claim to be neither conservative nor liberal, per se. But in my experience, rather than being moderate, what these people really tend to be is indifferent and disinterested when it comes to politics. Now, this indifference can stem from a number of different places based on one's background and experiences, and it can manifest in equally numerous ways. But at the core of this disinterested indifference is a desire to simply live their lives. As difficult as it is sometimes for those of us who are into politics, and even enjoy it to a degree to believe, I believe that the vast majority of people in this country want little to nothing to do with politics. And by that I mean, they don't want to think about politics and everything they do. They don't want to have to have politics thrust into their lives every single day. They don't want to have to get into potential arguments over wearing a mask or walking into a store. They don't want to confront difficult issues like crime, vagrancy, and abortion while they are struggling to earn an income, raise a family, run a household, and simply enjoy their lives. They understand that all those things are linked, for the most part, but the amount of time that they spend actually pondering the link is relatively small. And they like it that way and they do not want it to change. Now, in a very real sense, that is exactly why Republican government, little r, is the best form of civil, secular government that we can have. We are supposed to be able to go about our daily lives without contemplating politics, because we have elected representatives to do that contemplating for us. Not to rule over us, but to devote their time, energy, and resources into focusing on the politics so that we don't have to. And the original intent of that representation was that it would come from amongst the many indifferent people who are chosen for a time to set aside their lives in order to focus for a time, 
then return to their indifferent lives. Of course, we know that we have strayed from this intent just as we have strayed from most other parts of the Constitution. Getting involved in politics and government has become a career and an aim and goal in and of itself. As a result, or maybe in tandem with it, we have produced a political class in our society that has become so corrupt that it can't even see or smell its own filth. And, as that political class has grown in size and power, so too has this apathetic, mythical middle grown in disinterested indifference. Now, before anyone thinks that I am claiming that these people have no political views whatsoever, let me say that that is an equally false premise. Not only do they have political views, in many cases they have some of the most passionate views of anyone involved in politics. The trick is, and this is what helps to perpetuate the moderate independent idea, they typically have no broad unifying cohesion to their positions. And oftentimes they will be super passionate about one or two topics while seeming to be fairly affable with the rest. But don't let this appearance of affability fool you. Their convictions on these issues are just as strong. They are simply buried under layers of conflict avoidance. And when pressed, their convictions will typically shine through. Now, this concept isn't really a surprise for most political strategists. This basic formulaic understanding is not wrong or really in dispute. But what to do with that information is where there is great, great disagreement, with one side saying that politicians need to be, quote, moderate in their tone and positions, and the other side saying, no, we need to provide stark, clear differences. The former doesn't want the middle to really confront their issues because, and they may not be wrong about this, they believe that most people will simply tap out rather than engage. The latter side holds that being strong, clear, and consistent on these issues gives people something to aspire to and want to vote for. The former basically takes the position of, vote for us because we're not as bad as the other party, while the latter says, Vote for us because we have solid principles that we will fight and stand for no matter what. I happen to believe that the latter position is not only the morally superior one, but it is also, in the long run, the electorally superior one, when it is done authentically and consistently. Now, as the late great Rush Limbaugh used to say, and I'm paraphrasing here, Conservatism works wherever it is unabashedly tried. But for some reason, despite all of the evidence supporting this fact, politicians are captivated by the lie of the mythological middle, and the belief that only by being as neutral as possible could they ever hope to win their votes. Well, as the old saying goes, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for everything. So what's my solution? Ditch political parties? After all, the founders never really wanted them, right? Wrong. Some of the founding fathers, Washington most notably, hoped that the so-called political factioning wouldn't occur in the new republic. Hamilton even made part of his arguments in the Federalist Papers on the idea that the proposed constitution would eliminate the need or mechanisms for such factions. But, as we well know, that notion is farcical on its face. Since time immemorial, people have gathered together in groups around common beliefs and causes. Sometimes these beliefs and causes are very broad, and sometimes they are extremely specific. But in either case, all a political party is, is that very gathering of people. It's them coming together to say, we think things should be this and thus and governed as such. And then they act on that conviction. The problem is, or at least a problem is, that in one key area of the electoral process, the primary election, the state and the parties have become intermingled in ways never intended and 
in fact, harmful to our Republican system. See, if we are to argue that political parties are private, free associations of people, then shouldn't they exist and be run entirely by their constituent members? And this includes developing and implementing a nominating process for its members to follow in picking out an official party candidate. But that's not how it works right now. As it stands now, in just about every state, I believe, the state runs this nominating process via some sort of primary election system. And some of these are so-called closed primaries, where, in theory, only declared members of a political party can vote for candidates of that party. So, you register to vote as a Republican, and you get a Republican ballot with only Republican candidates on it. Others are supposedly open primaries, where it doesn't really matter what party you've registered as, if you choose one when you register, you get to choose which party's primary you'll vote in for that election cycle. So a registered Republican can vote in the Democrat primary, and a registered Communist can vote in the Libertarian primary, and on and on. The other form is the dubious jungle or top two primary. Now, this one seems a lot like the open primary, but instead of there being separate ballots for separate parties, in this one, all candidates are on the same ballot regardless of political affiliation, which is usually just listed as a candidate prefers such and such a party. And every voter in the state may vote in that race, with the top two or three or whatever vote getters proceeding on to the general election. So that could mean two candidates of the same party proceed, or that no political party's candidates proceed, aka independents, or any other conceivable mix. Now, whatever you think the merits of each of these methods of conducting primaries are, they all suffer from the same fundamental flaw. They are conducted and controlled by the state. As such, it is state law, not the actual parties, which get to determine all of the pertinent factors surrounding the election. And it is the state, in other words, the taxpayers, who fit the bill to run it. The parties themselves have little to no say in things like who gets to claim the party moniker, who gets to vote and influence the nominating process of the party. In many states, it's a well-known strategy to have a bulk of constituents from one party actually vote in the primary of their opposition, supposedly to influence and produce a candidate that is easier to beat or to try to deny the nomination of a particular candidate that they simply do not like. Now, where this issue meets the issue of the mythical moderate middle is that in at least the latter two types of primaries, People that have little or no ideological investment or agreement with a particular party have the potential to exercise a disproportionately strong influence in selecting that party's political standard bearer. Now, I don't know about you, but if I belong to a club or other organization, I usually do not appreciate people that have no affiliation with that organization being able to come in and dictate who will lead it. There is no other comparable instance that I know of where this happens. It is akin to a congregation allowing Muslims and atheists to participate in calling a new pastor, or in Catholics turning to the Dalai Lama and Hindus to select the next pope. It's like allowing the board of Chevy to dictate the policy at Ford, or allowing the students at Ohio State to pick the next football coach for Michigan. In what upside-down world does this make sense? Well, apparently, it makes perfect sense in the world of political primaries. Yes, I know all of the lame arguments in favor of the various primary methods, and I reject nearly all of them. Primarily because those arguments are predicated on the system that is currently in place, and on the idea that the state has, and should have, a role in this process. To that I say, why? Why on God's good green earth does the state need to conduct primary election for any office? If they run either closed or open primaries, 
then it should be the political parties themselves running it, as they see fit. For themselves, just like every other organization on the planet. If it is a jungle primary, then why are we wasting time and money on having two elections? Just have one wide-open, free-for-all general election and be done with it. Oh, but what about independents, I hear you cry. Well, what about them? It's not like they're left out in any way whatsoever. So they don't get to help a particular party nominate a candidate. So what? They still get to vote in the general election. If they feel very strongly about a particular candidate in any party, then they can drop the pretense of independence and join that party and participate. Nothing is stopping them. If they don't like any of the candidates running, okay. But that wouldn't be any different no matter what form of primary process you have. So how do I want it to run? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that I don't want primaries, as we now understand them, to exist at all. And certainly not at taxpayer expense. No, if I were to wave my magic wand, I would completely eliminate primaries. And instead allow political parties to decide entirely for themselves how they recruit endorse, and nominate candidates for elected office. Independents could still appear on the general ballot, but would have to meet certain threshold requirements set by the legislature of each state. That could be via signatures, or fundraising, or whatever other metric you want to establish. But for the parties, they would have reserved ballot space for their official nominees. And the person who fills that spot goes through that party's process however they said it. Now, does this mean that we could have a general ballot with 20 names for a particular race? Well, sure, in theory. But that is largely going to be up to the legislature of each state to determine what limits they want to place in that regard. Just as the legislature set the parameters for what constitutes a valid political party or any other host of things. But I seriously doubt that the number of slots on any general ballot would get out of hand. Primarily because I see no evidence that would suggest either a large number of independents running, or that there would be a great increase in the number of formal political parties that would have a reserved spot on the ballot. However, I'll admit I could be wrong. But I'm not. Now before I connect this back to the beginning of the episode and how this change would affect the mythological moderate middle, let me say that this idea is solidly for state elections. For national elections, for which we really only have one, the presidency, I see a whole other scheme for radically reconceptualizing the primary process. A, a playoff system, so to speak, but I'll explain that one in a future episode. For right now, I'm only speaking of state and local elections. Now, tying this back to the mythological moderate middle, since it is my contention that this supposedly vast swath of voters doesn't really exist, at least not as it is claimed they exist, my strong opinion is that we need more contrast, not less. When it comes to our political choices, we need political parties and candidates who take principled positions and stand by them not spaghetti-spined grifters that blow whichever way the wind seems to be going. Whether most people acknowledge it or not, humans are largely drawn to, not repelled by, strong convictions. The people who are averse to strong moral fortitude usually are so simply because they themselves have never confronted their own thoughts and convictions on a particular subject. As I alluded to earlier, it is not moderation that those people seek, but rather the avoidance of being confronted with a difficult moral choice. I say, let us stop coddling this group and instead force them to either sit out with their squeamish views or grow up and embrace the principles that are probably buried deep within them. Thus, it is my contention that we need to abandon the myth of the moderate middle and instead embrace a process that produces strong, clear-minded, and morally stout political candidates 
that take strong, clear-minded, and morally stout positions on issues. And part of doing that is fixing the dysfunctional primary process that sees politicians and their electoral machines constantly scheming to stand for nothing in the hope that by doing so, they can win this fantastical and mythological group called the moderate middle. This is a battle that can be fought and won if we have the moral fortitude to push for it. Okay, that'll do it for this episode. I know that there's a lot going on right now in the country, and the assaults on our liberties are only increasing. In our next episode, we are going to tackle at least some of the more pressing things that I see happening and discuss what we can do, what we should do, what is possible to do, and what is prudent to do in response to it all. If you want to follow more of my day-to-day thinking on liberty and even join the conversation a little, please follow the Hazardous Liberty Facebook page or on Twitter at Tyler G. Miller. You can also check out HazardousLiberty.com and subscribe to our email list there. And I will be trying to get back to a regular blogging schedule there soon as well. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, please like it, rate it, write a review, perhaps even follow the podcast. And most importantly, please consider sharing it with others who you think might also enjoy it. So until next time, God be with you all in all that you do. And remember, Keep the faith and keep up the fight.